Do you think technologies, given we are at a knowledge conference and one of the challenges in India is adequate skill levels in the youth, how are we going to ensure that Indian educational institutions push to provide the skills that the new technologies will demand? I'll answer that question, but I think we need to step back a bit because the theme for this session is somewhat different. And if I understand it right, it is about the institutions for governance. And then I'll answer that question on skills. A lot of people use the word governance without necessarily precisely defining the term. What I want to flag is whatever definitions there are on governance, as opposed to government, governance has an element of participation in the decision-making process, as opposed to the word government, which is about the government delivering different goods and services, perceived to be public goods and services. What I want to mention, and this is the reason I went off on that tangent, is we use the word government without recognizing, A, that there are three tiers of government in India. There is the union government, there are the state governments, and there are the local bodies. B, most of the public goods and services are actually delivered by local governments. C, unfortunately, India has been extremely centralized. It used to be centralized pre-1947. It became even more centralized post-1947. And D, one of the interesting things that's been happening in India in terms of that institutional structure is the greater decentralization and devolution and the empowering of the local bodies and we are just witnessing the beginnings of that. Now let me come to the skills issue. On the skills issue, there are different kinds of layers in the skills issue. And I just want to flag two or three of those. Although we are not discussing health, I want to tangentially mention health. Because if you look at education broadly and if you look at health broadly, whether you link them with the MDGs or the future SDGs, I'm a bit more concerned about health than I am about education, oblique skills. Now do not misunderstand. I'm not suggesting there isn't a problem with education or there isn't a problem with skills. Of course there is. But what I'm not very clear about is whether this is a temporary supply side problem which will ease itself, let's say, 10 years or 15 years from now. And the reason I'm saying this is there's been a sharp increase in gross enrollment rates in schools, at least certainly in primary schools. And therefore, somewhere down the line, the pressure will begin to mount for the supply side changes to happen be it in the nature of uh, vocational education, be in the nature of vocational education through schools, be it through the ITIs, be it through the higher education system. Having said that, one other point, and then I will um, um, leave it, uh, uh, pass it back to you, is on skills we must also recognize that it is not simply a lack of skills. It is also a serious geographical mismatch between the demand for skills happening in some parts and the supply of skills essentially happening in other parts. And there is a geographical mismatch which the employment exchanges were supposed to do. They did that very unsatisfactorily. And in so far as IT usage is concerned, whether it's in terms of that geographical map matching, whether it's in terms of actually setting up databases, IT has a great deal to offer. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, absolutely critical to link health and education, and one without the other really does not make for a better human development index, and that's something India could certainly do with improving, though we've already begun that journey, as you say. Um, and I agree with your point on the steer on institutions. And one particular area uh, where digital technologies are being 
pushed forward quite rightly is the area of financial inclusion. And of course, our, our institutions in this country for finance, again, as you said, from the period of, of uh, using uh, nationalization of banks to opening up the system has been exciting. Do you see a role for comparative technologies, for example, M-Pesa in Africa? We're talking about systems here about including everybody with a bank account. Are digital technologies with the financial sector institutions going to be able to deliver? Yes, yeah, sure. And then also, I'd like to quickly flag for you three or four different things that have begun to come together. Firstly, the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana accounts. You will hear complaints that all of these accounts are not clean in the sense we don't really know how many new accounts there are because of the way they have been opened up. But all said and done, some amount of vetting has been done. A large chunk of them are actually now clean accounts. What it therefore means is when we talk about financial inclusion, we have so far talked about people not having bank accounts. I think the nature of the discourse has to shift a little bit because a large number of people now have bank accounts and the zero balance accounts have also begun to drop gradually. So the discourse should shift to having financial products that persuade people who are opening these bank accounts, not only through the conventional banks, but also through mobile banking, through the micro ATMs, et cetera, et cetera, to persuade these people to use those bank accounts. The second thing I want to flag is about 45% of these accounts have now been seeded with Aadhaar numbers. So you have an integration of the Jandhan Yojana accounts with Aadhaar. The third thing I want to mention is some government benefits are already being rooted into these bank accounts. We have just seen the beginnings of that, but gradually I think it will have traction. And the fourth and last thing I want to mention is all said and done, governments will have to provide subsidies, and for years and years we have debated about who to subsidize. For the first time, we now, at least for the rural sector, have a database, which is called the SECC, which enables state governments to identify beneficiaries of subsidies. And certainly, a state like Bihar, for example, has already begun to use the SECC. So all of these bits and pieces coming together will mean, maybe not this year, maybe it will take a little bit of time, a complete revamping of public expenditure, financial inclusion, all kinds of inclusion, and subsidies. That's really exciting. And uh, uh, may I push you a little further on the point that you raised in your really interesting piece yesterday in the Indian Express on the point about data. And you made two very powerful points. One is improving data collection, but far more importantly, relating to your point about local government, the disaggregation of data. And might I ask you how improving that data could actually help us to target subsidies in a smarter fashion? Well, on data, of course we have a problem with data. When I say we have a problem with data, sometimes the data available, depending on which kind of indicator you're talking about, but the data available with a time lag. The second kind of data problem is a much more serious one, which is all said and done, India is still largely an informal and unorganized economy. As a process of development, in that process of transition, you have a transition to more formalized and organized systems. But overnight, we are demanding data requirements, whether it is for purposes of our own reasons or things like MDGs and SDGs, to have data compliance requirements that the system is simply not able to deliver. It's not a very simple issue of saying, let us amend the Collection of Statistics Act and insist that all enterprises should be registered because all of these things are meaningless because you can't very well enforce them. The biggest data challenge that we have 
is, as I said, for the formal and unorganized sector. And some of the data comes through censuses, which are a little bit more satisfactory. But to the extent it comes through surveys, they can be very, very unreliable, whether they concern the health sector or whether they concern uh, things like consumption expenditure. Yes, I do agree. I think um, across the board, as you know better than me, Dr. Ebroy, that the informal sector data collection is, is, is a challenge. Might I ask how you would see the role of maybe civil society or other local organizations in improving the match between supply and demand, which, as you know, is critical to make for smarter subsidies? Data. Yes, data or monitoring or evaluation or collection. I'm happy to go across the board. You know, data, there is a problem because... Uh, if you are using data for any government policy, you need data that is credible. You need data that is comparable across all of states. So data that you use for policy is slightly different from data that you collect for one particular isolated survey in one particular state or one particular district where you are trying to evaluate the success of a government program, like let's say the MGNREGS. But across the board, you can't really use data that is generated by NGOs for targeting subsidies or identifying poor people. I agree with you. I think it's more a method of triangulating what people see uh, being done in policies as distinct from what we say. And so it's a public confidence building measure. But taking that point uh, seriously, what about the role of public private partnerships in moving, as you rightly said, policy making from the federal level to the local level, particularly in terms of service delivery, in terms of instruments where the public becomes more aware of how data is both collected and how they can participate in the process? Yeah, perhaps, but I sort of, I dislike the word PPP because it means all kinds of different things to different people. In this particular context, we are really talking about PPPs in the social sector. Indeed, PPPs in the social sector are also possible. Uh, PPPs are not just about roads and airports. There are several successful examples of PPPs in the area of delivering certain public goods and services, uh, even in something like health. But that was not really the question. The question really was about the role, I would say now, NGOs in advocacy, persuading people about their rights, and in the process also about the need for data. And by the way, one of the remarkable things about the SCCC and why it's going to work is for the first time what amenities I possess, what indicators I have as a household are put up in the public domain and people can object. That takes care of errors of both omission, by which I mean a poor person has not been included, and commission, which is a non-poor person has been, which is why the SECC has become a bit more credible. But reacting to this PPP issue again, your PPP issue. Look, we've got 600,000 villages. And let's understand that some of these things will work in certain parts of India. There are parts of India, there are 100,000 villages still, where even if I said, let's do all of this, the requisite NGO simply does not exist. Uh, so don't misunderstand. There are places where there have been successful interventions by NGOs, but they also tend to be geographically located in certain parts of the country and not in certain other parts. I am very um, pleased you touched on the point of villages. I work on rural development, so I have a bias there. I'm particularly interested in, given the focus the current government has on smart cities, linking it to smart villages, uh, because otherwise when you, you provide um, better facilities in, in inter cities, which is great. You have a greater pool of migrants coming in, but their skills, going to my first point, are probably uh, very ill-suited to what's needed. So if we think about local development, as you said, as, as driven at the district level, in what way can these 600 villages actually benefit from some of the things that are being discussed 
at the level of urban hubs? Well, again, I have two or three comments. The first comment is, um, we don't have the time to discuss this, but the first comment I have is the smart city concept is grossly misunderstood. And people have their own impressions of what smartness entails without bothering to check that smartness is essentially what citizens determine that particular smart city to be. So this is an initiative where citizen participation is very much part of defining smartness. The second comment I want to make is that I am very averse to generalizations. And the reason I'm saying this, there are villages with population sizes of 5,000. And there are villages with population sizes of 100. And the implications are quite different for the village that has a population of 5,000 and the village that has a population of 100. There are probably, offhand I'm guessing, there are probably about 50,000 villages that have a population less than 100. And delivering any public good and service there is completely different from delivering public, uh, public goods and service in the 100 plus villages that we ostensibly have in a place like Delhi. The third issue I want to flag is, in my view, the real concern, governance concern in India is not about cities, which actually have municipalities, nor about villages where from the governance point of view we ostensibly have panchayats, but what are called census towns. And the increase in urbanization between 2001 and 2011 has really been sense in census towns. Census towns are towns as per the census. They have transcended the panchayat, but they don't have municipalities. And if you look at the urban chaos around any metro in India, most of that urban chaos will be in these census towns. I personally think that the smart cities will really work well in terms of improving governance, urban governance and urban planning in these census towns, provided, of course, state governments identify those areas. Because apart from anything else, there is a SPV designed to ensure that governance. But so far as the villages are concerned, I can't really generalize. Because as I said, I think the problem really is not with that 5,000, which is in the hinterland of some city, but in that village with a population of 100. I know we are running out of time. Would you be able to take a single question from the audience? Uh, please, um, could the mic go to the gentleman in the front? Thank you. We need a mic in the front, please, because Dr. Begro just has to run, I know, but he's been very kind. Hello. This was a question which we had uh, put forward to the um, participants out there on the uh, who were there before you. It's about uh, as we are talking about the transforming India's governance. Can you throw some light in terms of the India's education governance policies? When we are talking of primary schools, schools, colleges, I'm not talking about IITs and other prestigious institutions which are there. I'm talking about the institutions where a common man goes. Of course, there in IIT is also common man goes, but might be that is the cream. I'm talking of the policies which are supporting the mass population. No, no, I'm not very sure what the question is. I mean, the uh, question amounts to a complete discussion on the education sector, so I will keep it cryptic and almost in bulleted form. The trouble with all educational policy is that it is broken down into silos. Silos where there is still, in my view, a confusion between regulation and control. There is a clearly a terminal goal of moving from control to a regulatory kind of regime where the silos are broken down and integrated. The trouble is there is a great deal of resistance on the part of people who belong to the status quo to break down these silos. To give an example of that so that you do not misunderstand, it's not simply a question of the UGC and the AICTE. Because if I'm going to have a regulator 
the regulator has to bring under it the medical council, the nursing council, the bar council. But eventually, I think one is going to get there. And also in the process, what needs to be discussed, and more or less in terms of a terminal goal that's known, is it's not just regulation per se, but what the content of that regulation is going to be. And one of the problems with educational institutions across the board in India is that disclosure is very, very inadequate. And this is particularly important because you do have an asymmetry of information available to the people who are seeking education of whatever variety and the suppliers of that education. 